Hello and welcome to the Donahue Group. We're so glad you could join us for a half an hour of conversation and just maybe a little bit of controversy about issues that affect us as uh, citizens of this wonderful uh, county and state and even the nation from time to time. Joining me today, Cal Potter, uh, former state senator and assistant superintendent with the Department of Public Instruction for uh, Library Services. Cal Hello. always, <laughs> that's close, and Cal always gets the award for the longest title. Poor Tom Paneski, just a mere professor of mathematics <laughs> at the UW, uh, Sheboygan. <laughs> Ken Risto, a mere social studies teacher and some sort of mid-level bureaucrat in the Sheboygan Area School District. That's I'm, all right. <laughs> I'm Mary Lynn Donahue and uh, the host of this cheerful group. We're here, uh, boy, in the thick of winter. It certainly feels that way. And uh, uh, the election season for nonpartisan elections mm -hmm. in April are in full swing. And again, at least in the city of Sheboygan, there are lots and lots of contested races. And um, the headlines today, just to date when we're taping, are that Alderman Dan, former Alderman Dan Berg, has um, withdrawn from the fifth district race, where, fourth? Fourth. Sorry. Fourth. Where yeah. he was uh, taking on Jim Groff and Joe Heideman. Joe Heideman. So that race will be uh, a little uh, and Groff. easier. Mm -hmm. Easier. Um, uh, I think uh, Mr. Berg cited reasons of um, health and other reasons, and he said, I've come to the conclusion that because of the differences on the council, I would be little help to my constituents. So just what right out mean? there. I don't can, know what that Can anybody decipher that for me? I'm not 100% sure. Um, well, you could well, say, I'll represent my constituents fully. Uh, we think. Yeah. yeah. Well, he, I, you were there. Chair, I moderated the forum. Uh, and I, he wanted to make a statement up front, um, and I knew exactly what he was going to say. He, had, he mentioned that he was going to withdraw. And in his statement, he also said it's been very difficult on him and his wife uh, lately that he has been getting some difficult phone calls and uh, that he can't win. And, and he says between that and uh, the fact that there's another candidate in the race, and he did endorse Mr. Heidemann uh, and in the conclusion of his statement, his withdrawal statement. So a uh, combination of things, uh, press did not cover the fact that he was uh, disheartened by some of the feedback that had been coming his way okay. when he entered the race. Now, okay. what, who, where that's coming from and, and why and how many people are involved, I don't know. But uh, he was definitely down. He was a very sad uh, individual when he made that statement. And, uh, but I, I think there, was a, there are a number of reasons that mm -hmm. sort of piling on. And he said, this is, I don't want this anymore. <laughs> And mm -hmm. with the fact, as I said, Heidemann uh, challenged the, the incumbent Graf, I think he felt that there was a competition, there was a choice for the voter. Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah, I, I don't know why uh, Dan might have thought that the whole atmosphere was a whole lot more friendly than it had yeah. when he left the council. It seems to me that the, the players have changed. Um, I think the council is getting work done and, and so forth, but there still seems to be some animosity not quite at the pitch and tone that it was the year before, but it's still um, it's still a lively body to be on as opposed to the school board, but we'll get to that. Um, Cal, you indicated that you had uh, moderated a discussion that the I think the Democratic Party hosted for all the aldermanic okay. candidates, and most everyone showed up, um, which led me to think you'd be there a really long time. Well, I, I, I set a limit of three minutes for an introductory to a statement, and so all uh, 18 people made a statement and within an hour so it was a well, nice very good. it was a very good capsule I think uh, uh, the other people who were there new particular newcomers to the uh, to, to the console type races really did pay attention I think they learned things they saw issues that probably they never thought would would come up but uh, Corey Bauck uh, was on a business trip and his wife was there just handed out a statement and uh, alderman older person uh, Radke did not come he said he was ill um, and then with Berg dropping out, but uh, we had 18 in present That's out of the 20. Uh, I did send a letter out the day after the nomination papers yeah. were, uh, were filed, so I think we got our foot in the door a little before the Taxpayers Alliance, so everybody was uh, mm -hmm. amenable to the form, and it worked out nicely. Um, before we go any further, with Berg dropping out this late, there isn't any need for a primary in that particular aldermanic That's district, correct. so th there isn't going to be a primary 
or is it too uh, late to I'm do not, that? We I'm haven't not sure. heard. I mean, yeah. I don't know the answer to that. It's His name is on the ballot. His name would be yeah. on the There's ballot. no way that you ballot. can withdraw your candidacy, okay. and that's okay. why dead people win sometimes. And um, there's potentially that he could win. He could win. I the would primary. presume there would be a primary. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I would presume, although I do not know that for a fact. Yeah. So it's important for people who are supporting either Heidemann or uh, Graf to still show up the day of the primary. Mm -hmm. Well, it's important for the city clerk to let us know what the situation is at the yeah. Yeah. And okay. I for that race. Yeah. I don't want to take us too far off yeah. task, but I was yeah. just thinking about that on the way over here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, Cal, you uh, not only were there, but you were running the show uh, yesterday. Uh, the press article indicates that the financial status of the city was really the primary mm, focus or topic. Yes. Uh, of the 18 statements that were made, the uh, repetitive was the property tax burden in the city and uh, good it is high and many of them said we need to have growth we need to have an industrial park expansion was raised by several that uh, one candidate mentioned that two firms were unable to find the size of parcel they needed in the industrial park that's uh, on the south end of Sheboygan mm. so that uh, one of their priorities is to expand the park that's in good. some way um, another is to just build up the uh, economic development in the city, period. Uh, another person cited um, reuse of some blighted lands and so on, that we could uh, have more economic development, build a tax base, that the That's city good. needs to, to do that. And then there are others repeatedly said we need to examine uh, services and what's essential and um, downsizing where we have to downsize and appropriate uh, level of staffing and so on, but uh, expenses that the cities are, city incurs as well as the tax burden was a repeated um, uh, issue that was, was brought up in the, in the whole issue. Uh, the police station came up several times with uh, obviously with a couple people on the in candidacy list from former police officers and a few police officers in the audience. Uh, they did uh, raise issues of how you're going to equip it. Um, uh, balances in various accounts and whether they could be used, uh, things like that. Um, several candidates uh, who are incumbents uh, did uh, toss out plaudits that the uh, wheel tax was uh, repealed as well as the uh, stormwater fee was repealed. And uh, so there, there were a number of candidates saying things are going in the right direction, things, the council works better now than it did before, and, and sort of the incumbents saying, why do we need to change in essence uh, things are, are are going along better people they, they're more sensitive they do communicate better um, and then others are saying communication the challengers many of them saying communication needs to be improved uh, we need to have less contentiousness you know how much of this is a carryover in the theme that occurred before the turnover that did occur in the council before with the change in mayors and so on I don't know but uh, there were a share of people saying things have to be financially better analyzed. Uh, there are a couple people who are insurance people, a couple people who are financial advisors who are running, um, particularly in the first district there are five candidates and several are, are people that they, who dabble in the insurance and financial end of things who said we need to do uh, you know things like zero-based budgeting and more scrutiny and better control of the dollars and that type of thing. Yeah. Um, this race is, I think, notable for the fact that several retired police officers are running and yes. the, the wife of a current police officer. Um, did you get a sense that um, a police department agenda was being advanced by those candidates? Not at all. Um, okay. uh, the three, there were three retired, as you said, officers running and a spouse of a, an officer. And that's out of the uh, 20 candidates, now 19 with Berg's mm -hmm. departure. Uh, so four of those. Uh, Mr. Mon Wongman, uh, Bill Wongman, did raise the issue. Um, he did say, I'm retired, and Christensen's retired, and Van der West is retired, and, and he says, none of us think alike. Um, he said, if we got on any topic, he says, you would find myself and these other guys who, who I know um, will come up with different conclusions and make different choices. So do not, he took sort of the preemptive strike, he said, don't paint us all with the same brush. Don't think that we're here to represent the police department. We're individuals who have, um, in retirement, moved on, many times uh, pursuing other activities today. Mm -hmm. One sells insurance, I guess, and others, and so, well, they, they, they do different things today. And they say that uh, 
you can expect independent thought. So there was a, there was a sensitivity there, and Mr. Wangaman took the initiative in his statement to talk about it. Okay, I remember in an old school board race, uh, the, um, the uh, phrase, the four-man machine, was, uh, was used, uh, the an accusation that, that people were together and working together mm -hmm. and thinking together, and so no four-man machine here, three-man and yeah. one-woman machine. So this was just the candidates, there were no questions and no feedback or anything, it was just well, we, candidates we, expressing you themselves. You had questions, right? Yeah, we had an hour. Oh, you had an hour of questions, too? Yes. Yes. Oh, mm -hmm. okay. Um, but I, that's why I set the limit of three minutes. Otherwise, I'd been there all night listening to candidates. And <coughs> by taking an hour of statements, then we opened it up. And then we had everybody in the audience um, direct their question to a particular district. Okay. And then we had questions that, you know, ranged from <coughs> financing of the police uh, uh, department as well as uh, mass transit, a uh, number of different issues that came up. Yeah, well, that's fun. Sounds okay. pretty good. What kind of begs the question though, Cal, all of a sudden sort of spontaneously there's a fervor of civic responsibility among retired police officers? Well that, that I mean what were they well, when they made their statements, was there some sort of common theme among those those fellows and, and, and Mrs. Tashinsky? Um, well uh, Lyle Vanderwist said he lived in this community his entire life. He served the police department for thirty some years mm -hmm. and he just felt an interest and, and he felt he wanted to be part of being in the government. Um, none of them uh, brought up that they had a bone to pick with anybody about police officers or you know, how they're treated or the police department how it's treated. So all stayed mm -hmm. on the issue of uh, I bring to the table talents that I'd like to share on the council. So they didn't let on that they had any agenda that was uh, reactive to how the police department might have been or will be treated. How was your audience? A good number? Yeah. Um, Press at 30, I would say it's more like 50 that came. But wow. So I thought, I thought it was good. good I, I think that's, th I mean, actually on a, on a cold winter's night, <laughs> yeah, sure. I think that's a fairly impressive turnout. Yeah. And uh, as particularly an aside, early on. As an aside, I didn't even know Skybox. They were at Skybox. I didn't know they had a uh, room downstairs yes, where you could host some kind of event like that. Yeah. Yeah. That yeah. might be the old... The old Hofbrau. The old Hofbrau. The Rothskeller. Yeah. The Rothskeller. Yeah, that's yeah. what it used to be called. I don't know if they've. Re I imagine they've renovated that room as much as they've renovated everything else yes, to the point is. where you don't recognize yeah. it. Well, it's um, it used to have a ceiling that was about six and a half uh, feet. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I was brushing my Did anybody get those who were speaking, Cal, about um, needing to look at greater scrutiny at the city budget and bring costs down? Lay, lay out any specifics or any areas they thought were. Those kind of cuts could be made. Uh, Normally they avoid one, those kind of things. Well, one person talked about, uh, several people talked about the benefit package right. that public employees yeah. have. And of course, that's always problematic when you have unions, you have to negotiate. You don't unilaterally mm -hmm. say you're going to cut benefits. But uh, health care and uh, insurance in general uh, being, some of them cited as being out of line to the, proper, to the private sector. Uh, that was raised. Uh, one candidate raised the bus system saying that we ought to go to uh, a dial, dial a ride, that it's more actually more focused. Um, that this person cited several large cities that had gone to dial a ride where they come right to your door and you don't have the criticism, as much criticism of empty buses. Of course, that leads into the whole issue of how the school system needs the bus system because, of, of course, you don't have, uh, in a larger city, you don't have bus, uh, school bus uh, buses running the routes, you have the mass transit who takes care of that need. So that would be another dimension of, of how you would have to alter that. But a, a number of people talked about uh, prioritizing services. Well, of course, that's oftentimes difficult because uh, whose service is more important? It's the one you use, I guess, or the one that you're missing at that particular instance. Yeah. Well, certainly the county has, you know, struggled with that. Yeah. and. Um, I know the school district has tried to prioritize the services and programs, yeah. and uh, unless something is really fairly clearly pretty frivolous, there's always a constituency, there's always an articulated need, and it really is hard to balance out, you know, potholes in the street versus, you know, buying new trees versus 5% contribution to health insurance versus, you know, and it just goes, goes on and on. So well, 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 you should start with this is the pot of money I have, mm -hmm. instead of these are the services I want to offer, because then, then you, the pot of money grows when you have the service. You start, this is the pot of money I have. 
I have to do this, I have to do this, and then you start to prioritize when the pot starts disappearing. Mm -hmm. Well, what? and that actually has been very effective, and we'll, we'll get to that a little bit later in the program about the, uh, the school district, which had, school districts in general, had qualified economic offers or QEOs imposed on them in 1993. Three or four. Ninety-four. Along those lines. Uh, and there's some chatter about uh, repealing the QEO, but as a school board member at that time, I was able to say, along with my fellow school board members, we have this pot of money. Yep. That's it. And of course, revenue caps have been imposed on on municipalities now, at least for two years. Although, I mean, there's room for growth, but it's it's a limited it's a limited growth. But uh, but that is. Uh, that is interesting. Yeah. Their long cultures, hard cultures to change, where you know unions and management have worked together in a certain way for years and years and years and years. And if it's a new time, is it a new time? I'm not sure it is. But if it is, how do you how do you make those cultural changes? Well, you know, there's one aspect of this whole issue of taxation that people very seldom bring up, and that is the shift of the tax burden in the state from a broad base to a very narrow base. Correct. Um, it goes back to the Lucy administration starting with M&E, machinery and equipment. It was taken off the tax rolls. And then it was followed by pers line A, personal property, which is inventories and uh, other things that are in a manufacturing sense, uh, in, uh, materials. Then we uh, went into egg land uh, value, mm -hmm. use value. So today, a farmer doesn't pay a lot on their farmland any longer. Right. Um, computers recently were taken off the property tax rolls. You can just go through a, almost a 30-year period, and there was one property tax exemption after another enacted by the legislature that has shifted substantially the tax burden from a broad base of property to homeowners. And at the same time, um, shared revenue on the federal level was cut out during the Reagan, starting in the Reagan years and continued throughout the um, years of budget cutting. Um, on the state level, the decision was made that there'll be more school aids, two-thirds state pickup, not putting as much into shared revenue. And so mm -hmm. shared revenues to municipalities on the state level were cut back or, or froze or, or minimized. So you add up that with the squeeze that energy costs and health care costs and all the other things that are that uh, municipalities face it is a it is something that people need to realize i'm not making excuses i'm just saying the homeowner today is picking up a bigger part of the burden than they have say 30 years ago I, yeah i agree with that and I just add a couple other things nonprofits get mm -hmm. the property tax exemption and the two things that the council repealed uh, the stormwater tax that was applied evenly to all including the nonprofit so they were now they're going to get the free ride and the uh, wheel tax uh, some people have five to six cars and other people have one and their nonprofits have cars and trucks and stuff mm -hmm. and that's now gone too so uh, but I think you throw the nonprofit, and then there's yeah. a big chunk of people who are nonprofits yeah. that don't get, don't have to pay the property tax. Sure, a couple things though. I mean, I do think Cal's point is very well taken. Is that, yeah. you know, we talk about Wisconsin being a property tax hell, and Sheboygan yes. is certainly an expensive place to live. But you're exactly right. Is that the shift in the tax burden has been fairly astonishing, but it's been quiet. It's been incremental. And so the, the load for property homeowners has just grown and grown and grown. Yeah. And so it, it actually is a selling point in Wisconsin that, that taxes for manufacturing concerns, at least regarding personal and real property, are significantly less than they used to be. Mm -hmm. So And some people as they retire leave the state just for that True. that reason. They don't you know there, there's no arguing that, you know, people with a decent house are paying five, six, seven thousand mm dollars -hmm. in property tax. And it's outrageous for somebody who's on a fixed income. Uh, how do you change it? What you do is you start examining uh, the end result of this shift and saying, well, maybe the state ought to do what a Florida does 
and you start looking at your excise taxes on liquor and beer and start looking at your sales tax and say, well, maybe uh, if we have a tourist trade that's worth anything, as Florida really does, mm -hmm. um, maybe you ought to go to a 7% sales tax. I don't like the sales tax either. It's regressive, but it's less regressive than the property taxes. At least you have some choice whether you're going to buy a $50,000 car or a $10,000 car or, or, or a lot of other items. Um, so there maybe ought to be an examination of how we finance some of our units of, of government in this state. And uh, you know, there's always been a reluctance to do that because people don't want occupational taxes or local income taxes sure. or local sales taxes. Although we have granted things to the brewers and we've granted things to counties, a half a percent, which they can levy. But cities don't have that flexibility. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And maybe it's, it's time we do that because yeah. every election we hear from people who are saying there are people who are being taxed out of their home. Well, if that's you know, the case, and I'm sure it is in many cases, mm -hmm. uh, we ought to look at a different way of financing these services. Let somebody who, you know, one of the beauties of the sales tax, of course, in a tourist state, and if, if we brag about how many Illinois people come up here, yeah. is that they're paying the tax, you know, when they, when they spend that their money true. in the state. That is true. Well, that actually, in a backdoor way, segues into the school board race. <laughs> Just bringing okay. it back to, to a local, um, to a local uh, uh, level. Um, and whatever our conversation is, we, it, it would really behoove us to, to be behaved enough so that Risto here does not get fired. But in any event. <laughs> um, Tell me about the candidate. I'm tenured. School board, because I really don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm about pretty the much candidate. tenured. I think there I'm are gonna, three okay. positions that are open okay. two town positions or non city positions. We include the town of Wilson, town of Sheboygan, uh, actually, the town of Centerville, Cleveland. and the village of Cleveland. And, and so we have some surrounding areas. Two of the nine spots are for those townies, as we call them, and then there's one city spot that's open. Maishua Vang, um, who was appointed and then won a one-year term, is retiring. She's having a fifth child and for some reason doesn't think she has time for the school board. I can't understand why. <laughs> so um, those meetings about induced labor. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Are, are a good thing, so. um, but Jeff Squire is running. Uh, now for the town spots, we've got three running for two. Uh, Jeff Squire. Mark Mansell, who was recently appointed to take Teresa Blundell's spot, and Al Yante, who was, um, was in that race to be appointed, or, or was one of the candidates for the appointment that Mark Mansell won, but Al, a uh, retired principal of Jefferson School, Jefferson. is running. Oh, so we have a principal running. Ex-principal. Ex-principal running. Against uh, Mark Mansell and Jeff Squire. Okay. Now, and Mark, Mark Mansell is a detective. Um, with the Sheboygan um, Sheriff's Department. Okay. Nice guy. And uh, Jeff Squire, of course, has been around for a while and uh, is currently the president of the board and I guess wants another three year okay. term. And at the city level, uh, with my Shua leaving, uh, Scott Lewandowski, who is a candidate for the oh, Common Council, is also a candidate for the school board. He's running against Fong Lee, who is a Hmong fella who uh, graduated from Lakeland College and um, has three little kids. And uh, so it's interesting. Scott Lewandowski and Al Yante, from what I have read in the newspaper, are clearly very, very critical of the school system. And I, and I, I don't know how they're focusing so much just on Sheboygan, but education in general. They don't really much care for the way things are being done now. Um, I don't get that. I don't know where some of the other candidates stand, but I don't, I don't get much of, much of an idea. But it's a real contested race, which we haven't had in the school district for a little while. Since, um, two th oh my, 2004, I think we had a contested race, or maybe not, 2003, but it's been a few, a couple of years in the cycle, because mm -hmm. every three years you have three, or every two years, right? Mm. You have three coming up? Every year. Every year, yeah, every that's year. right. That's, that's right. Every yeah. three, every year, we have three coming off in a mm -hmm. rotating so right. Yeah. Yeah. or up for election. Are there so. any issues? I mean, curriculum issues. I know budget issues. Seems like it's always a budget issue. Well, it's going to be kind of hard to tell because nobody's really had a chance much to talk about these issues yet. I know that uh, during the gubernatorial race, uh, Al Yante wrote a letter to the editor, which pretty much supported Governor. Well, sorry, Green for Governor, Representative Green for Governor, and took a couple of pretty big swipes at. Uh, the Wisconsin Teachers Association, Wisconsin Educational Association, the Teachers Union. Um, 
saying that, you know, pretty much from Al's perspective, the letter pretty much argued that, you know, unions are one of the major reasons why, you know, education is in such a sorry state that it is. Um, but other than that, uh, locally he hasn't said too much. No, he's been a principal, he's been in a lot of meetings. Uh, I'm sure he knows a little bit about how the district works um, compared to, say, a layperson coming into the, into the board setting. And, um, and we'll see. And we'll see how that all plays out. Yeah, it, it should be interesting. Um, um, it is good, I think, in a district where 33% of our students are minority students, 33, 35%. Um, to have minority representation on the board. And um, by all reports, my show of Aang did a wonderful job. Uh, and um, so it'll be interesting to see how things play out. Just in the last couple of minutes, one of the issues, and uh, when I was on the school board, negotiations with, with the unions was pretty simple because we had this qualified economic offer, 3.8%. Um, and uh, we usually- Take it or leave it. Take it or leave it. Well, we yeah. actually, Usually the total package exceeded the 3.8 percent, yeah. and there was a decent relationship between the unions and the administration. I felt um, uh, consensus bargaining, and which has some good points to it. Uh, the push now in Madison, um, WEAC, the Wisconsin Education Association Council, put a ton of money into Doyle's race. Wisconsin Manufacturers and Commerce put a ton of money into, into Green's race. Um, it sounds like uh, there may be votes to repeal the QEO. What do you think? I mean, you one of the go first? <laughs> no. <laughs> well, no. if that's going to really, open it up to uh, you know, the, the the challenge there is that the QEO was of course tied to the, as Cal was saying earlier, the commitment to funding of two thirds of local government, and those two pieces sort of fit together, and so any kind of taking off of, you know, once you start playing with that whole system, you're going to have to revise and reform, reformulate everything. Um, you know, so I, I just really think that, that um, I'm a little cynical. I th uh, no. I'm a little cynical about Really? I think the Senate will pass it, and I think the Assembly won't pass it, and then the governor can say, you know, we That's just right. kick the can down the road. Because if you take off the QEO caps as much as they've hurts and uh, certain districts. I don't think they've really hurt Sheboygan terribly much, the truth be told, because we're a growing district given the funding formulas. But, um, but I think you're gonna kick the can down the road for another couple of years and, and, and look at it much more systematically. Right now, I haven't seen anything coming out of the legislature beyond let's get rid of that piece. If you do that, you're gonna have to start looking at the two-thirds commitment and uh, maybe and that's the, what they wanna do. And the funding formulas, which I think are, yeah. are really skewed. And the Wisconsin Supreme Court has said, eh, not the best system in the world, but constitutionally not infirm. And so- Barely passing constitutional muster, right. barely. But, and I think that ought to be looked at as well, some sort of more equitable form of funding across districts. But. So in any event, we're wrapping up, but it was an enjoyable conversation and we'll be back.